Good afternoon, everyone. Our speaker today has become a staple of our lecture series. We depend on him to provide nothing less than an explanation of why the Armenian Genocide happened, what ramifications it has had for the Armenian people, and why in the year 2020, the genocide is not yet fully recognized. Dr. Laporta provides a comprehensive explanation of all of this and more. Sergio received his BA at Columbia and his PhD at Harvard, working in Near Eastern languages and civilizations. He was a lecturer in Armenian studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem before settling in at CSU Fresno, which sponsors a very broad program of Armenian studies in the midst of a very large and supportive Armenian community. Professor Laporta is currently the High and Isabel Berberian Professor of Armenian Studies. He is also Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of the Society for Armenian Studies. And he is currently the Interim Assistant Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities, so I'm sure he was very happy to escape to be with us today. Uh, please welcome him. Can people hear me? Is this working? Yeah, hello? I guess I got it up here. Hello, everyone. Is this working? I don't know. No? It was. I got to get it up for right. Let's see how high I can get this. Thing. All right, I can also do this. That'll work. I'll just hold it like this. Good afternoon. Thank you, Diane. Um, and I'd like to thank the Alliance for the Prevention of Genocide for inviting uh, me again. This is such a great um, lecture series on the Holocaust and genocide. Uh, and it's so wonderful to know that um, this many students every year after year um, are learning about this topic. Um, I'd also like to wish you a happy uh, Super Tuesday. And uh, hopefully you all went out and voted regardless of your party affiliation. Um, and do your civic duty. You always feel good afterwards. Or hopefully you mailed it in. And that's what I did because I couldn't be home today. Um, <clears throat> my lecture today will be about the Armenian Genocide. Um, I'll talk about the dates uh, in a little bit. Um, and um, I also know that uh, the theme for this year's lecture series on denialism, so I will also be talking about the politics of denial and the tactics of denialism in this talk. Sort of here? This is better. Okay, I'll, I'll try to keep it up here. Okay. The first good news is we finally have United States recognition of the Armenian Genocide, 105 years after it happened. Yeah, that can get an applause. Uh, I'll talk uh, a little bit more about that too as we go on this is qualified but on october 29 2019 the house of representatives passed a resolution by an overwhelming majority regarding the armenian genocide and then on december 12 2019 uh, the senate unanimously passed the resolution uh, both resolutions um, have a historical preamble and uh, some of the points at which they bring up in that preamble i will be discussing today and then they all uh, have three uh, central points that the point of the resolution is to, one, commemorate the Armenian Genocide through official recognition and remembrance. Two, reject efforts to enlist, engage, or otherwise associate the United States government with denial of the Armenian Genocide or any other genocide. And three, encourage education and public understanding of the facts of the Armenian Genocide, including the role of the United States in humanitarian relief efforts and the relevance of the Armenian Genocide to modern day crimes against humanity. And so this was very nice when they passed this. It fits in exactly what um, I think this lecture series is trying to do um, on a large scale. And what I uh, hope I get across uh, in the lecture today as I have in, in, in previous years. Okay. So first of all, defining genocide. Uh, the word genocide did not exist in 1914, 1915, right? At the beginning of the 20th century. It was actually, um, had to, uh, newspapers and political papers of the time had to use other expressions like mass killing, attempts at total annihilation, the extinction of a people. And it wasn't until um, Raphael Lemkin in 1944 coined the term genocide based on uh, the Armenian example as a case study as well as uh, the Holocaust. Uh, that his, he lost many f uh, family members in the Holocaust. He was a Polish Jewish uh, jurist. And he came up with the word genocide, the killing of an entire people, uh, in order to sort of redefine these crimes against humanity, right? That there is something a little bit different about these that they needed their own uh, term. And we'll talk more about that as we go through, but uh, at least at the very beginning, we should realize that the Armenian example is one of the case studies, one of the pillars for defining 
uh, the term uh, genocide. Um, the Armenian Genocide is recognized as such um, by the International Association of Genocide Scholars, the International Center for Transitional Justice, uh, the Eli Wiesel Foundation for Humanity, the European Parliament, the Council of Europe, the World Council of Churches, 32 countries, as we now includes the United States, um, and the Vatican City, um, and as well as by Turkish scholars um, who are coming to grips and recognizing their own past. Uh, this is um, a monument we built at Fresno State, uh, thanks to the efforts of the Armenian community uh, of Fresno, California. Um, it's uh, the largest Armenian Genocide Memorial on any campus uh, in the U.S. And this was for the centenary of the Armenian Genocide in, in 2015. Um, so it has now reached uh, the stage where recognition is pretty much uh, universal, except, of course, for Turkey. Okay, so let's just look at some basic facts of the Armenian Genocide itself when we talk about this. One, on April 24th, 1915, 250 Armenian intellectuals in the Ottoman Empire were arrested. Most of them were soon executed. This is traditionally taken as the beginning of the Armenian Genocide. As what the Ottoman authorities did was get rid of any leader that could be in the position of resistance to what was going to uh, happen uh, with the extermination of the rest of the population. So they gathered the political leaders, the religious leaders, the intellectuals, right, to get them out of the way at the very beginning. And that's why the commemoration of the Armenian Genocide is held every April 24th. <clears throat> Between 1915 and 1923, approximately 1.5 million people were killed. It may have been more. Um, and there were 800,000 people killed in the first four months. Uh, we'll look again at this uh, figure later. Uh, it stands out. It's the exact same rate of killing, 200,000 people a month, as you found uh, more recently with the Rwandan genocide. Um, one of the reasons why people are able to get away with genocide is that it's very, very quick. Um, it happens, the majority of the killing happens very uh, early on. Uh, of course, the longer it takes, the more uh, deaths there are, but you can see half of the deaths happened in the first four months. Um, and it occurred uh, in the Ottoman Empire under the direction of the Ruling Committee for Union and Progress, uh, otherwise known as the CUP uh, party. Uh, they're the ones who put the, art, uh, the orders into place, not the Ottoman Sultan, who was not in power at the time, um, and they were the ones who uh, actually executed um, the policy of extermination. And as I like to say, this is a defining moment of Armenian history, but, uh, sorry, it's a, de, it's a defining moment of Armenian history, but not the defining moment of Armenian history. Armenian history, as we'll see, is very long. Um, the Armenian people um, themselves, as a, as a written culture, are over 1,600 years old. Um, as a Christian culture, over 1,700 years old. As inhabiting the Armenian plateau, they go back millennia. So this is an old culture. Um, bad things have happened to them in the past, unfortunately, like to every people. Bad things, un unfortunately, will happen to them in the future, or hopefully not, uh, uh, will not happen to them. But the, they have survived this, and they will continue um, afterwards. So we, we have to make sure that this does not become how Armenians you know, are defined. Um, okay, and the, finally, that the genocide is denied to this day uh, by the Republic of Turkey. So they still don't say that it happened, and again, at the end of this lecture, we'll get into reasons why and the tactics they use to try and make sure that that stays the dominant narrative. All right. And the other thing we should know is that the Armenian Genocide took place with the killing of other people um, in the Ottoman Empire at the same time. Assyrian Christians, um, contemporary reports somewhere around 200 to 250,000 killed in southeastern Turkey and the Urmia region of Iran between 1915 and 1923 and it's possibly as high as 400,000 uh, 400, people. Uh, so we're looking at pretty much half of the Assyrian population that was living in the Ottoman Empire. Likewise, uh, there were the Greek um, inhabitants of the Ottoman Empire that were also uh, both killed and um, exiled. So, and the numbers here again range from 450,000 to 900,000. Um, and then there was a catastrophe at Smyrna, which was quite, um, uh, uh, quite famous in 1922, where up to 100,000 people uh, may have been killed, both Greeks and Armenians. Um, according to reports, the uh, Ottoman troops, or the Turkish troops at that point, had set uh, the old city on fire and pushed the population, the Greek and Armenian population, to the, uh, to, the, um, to the water's edge, and then basically they had to jump in the water, and most of them drowned if they weren't um, killed uh, by the fire, since most people didn't know how to swim. Uh, so uh, about 100,000 people may have died 
uh, in that catastrophe. And here are the national flags of the three peoples. And I have to say that the, um, both the International Association of Genocide Scholars um, and the Republic of Armenia uh, recognize these three genocides. So they also recognize, the, the Armenians also recognize the genocide of the Assyrians um, and of the Greeks. So this was not just, it was not, although the Armenians bore, let's say, a particular um, uh, uh, or um, an emphatic brunt of the extermination policy, this was a much larger scaled um, extermination or ethnic cleansing uh, of the Ottoman Empire undertaken by the authorities. Okay, so why is this important 105 years later? And this is one of the questions that I know people say, like, come on, it happened so long ago, why is it important? So one thing is the denial of genocide, is, it's, it's, it's the continuation of it. Right, so until, actually, that's why I put 1915 to 2020 was because the, uh, as, as long as Turkey continues to deny the Armenian Genocide, they are, in fact, continuing to perpetrate the Armenian Genocide. There is no way that the victims of genocide can actually come full circle and fully heal until the perpetrators um, at least recognize what they did. So that's one reason why it's still important. Uh, another um, reason why, from a historical perspective, I think it's important is because the Armenian Genocide is very much linked to our concept of modernity. We'll get this, um, again, a little later in the lecture, um, but it's very important to realize that if you're not just a student of Armenian studies, but if you're a, a student of 20th century history, right, that the Armenian Genocide plays a huge role in how the modern world uh, took shape. Um, other genocides are indeed still being committed today. And of course, just as the U.S. resolution notes, that um, since the Armenian Genocide in many respects was the case example upon which uh, uh, later genocides followed, uh, it's important to study the roots of it, right? So in order to help prevent genocides, you need to understand the origins and how they're perpetrated, and the Armenian Genocide provides, as we'll see, a paradigm of how genocide is actually perpetrated. And then finally, uh, and specifically for today's talk, denial of genocide and also recognition of genocide are not, as much as people like to say this is a matter for historians to debate, it, they're not. Um, we'll talk about the role of historians later on, or at least what role historians can play in, in studying genocide, but denial and recognition are very much tied to contemporary politics. Um, and in order to understand why the Uni United States recognizes or doesn't recognize, or why Turkey doesn't recognize, you also have to understand the contemporary political situation. So study of the Armenian Genocide, as well as of other genocides, are important. And you can say, see this with other ones that are going around um, now, um, also in, in places like Rwanda, or uh, no matter where you are, and what's going on in Syria. All right, the study of these things are not just an object for historians to look at, but they're very much in uh, in touch with what's going on in our world today. Okay, so first of all, who are the Armenians? How many people here know Armenians? Well, that's good. I think that's the most I've seen. That's good. Every year it's gotten, it's gotten higher. And how many people here studied the Armenian Genocide in high school? Yeah, that's still bad. I, I see a couple of hands go up, but you know, by law you're supposed to know it. Uh, California did pass a resolution that if you, if you went to a California high school, they're supposed to have taught you about the Armenian Genocide. Um, hopefully now it'll be easier to have that happen um, uh, because I realize, I ask that question every year I come here and it's no more than two or three people who raise their hand, which is always a little bit disturbing. But um, anyway, I just did want to talk a little bit first about who the Armenians um, are. And um, people are probably familiar with Armenian food if you're here in California. That's one thing to like, you know, you know we have pilaf, um, we have lachmajun, we have various types of dolma, Yalanji and kebab, right? So one thing that people usually know about Armenians are Armenian food and that they partake of the, uh, of the cuisine of the Middle East and of the Levant in general, um, and it tends to be very tasty, right? Armenians are also famous for their music. Um, uh, we have, um, like, uh, just blanked on his name, it'll come to me. Thank you, Khachaturian, Aram Khachaturian. Uh, Ziljan, maker of the cymbals. Uh, we have Charles Osnavour, who recently passed away. It was a great chanteur. Um, and of course, System of a Down. Um, and uh, uh, so Armenians, in, in, in whether they're in the Republic of Armenia, whether they're in France, or whether they're in the United States throughout the diaspora, are also contributing to the cultural scene of the countries that they've moved to. 
Uh, we also have William Soroyan, if you're from California, particularly from, from Fresno. He's, uh, you know, Fresno's uh, most famous inhabitant, um, one of the great authors of American literature, underappreciated today. He was very, very popular um, before World War II in the pre-war period. Uh, his popularity tended to, it, it dropped off afterwards. Um, it's making somewhat of a resurgence now, but I encourage you all to go out and read um, some of his writings because uh, he's actually an, an excellent writer in the, in the great American tradition. Very clear um, and, and simple but poetic in the way he, he writes. He's also what I would consider the first ethnic writer of the United States in the sense that he, his books are filled with characters that have Armenian last names, Latino last names, um, you know, non-European last names who are normal characters in the story. They're not pointed out to be different than anyone else, but they make up the, um, the community that he grew up in because a lot of his stories take place in the Central Valley. Um, and all those people are there with their, with, uh, with their names intact. And that's probably, that may be the first time that you had such an event happen in American literature in that way. Um, okay, and, and let's look at some other significant factors of Armenian self-identity. So what, what, how do Armenians define themselves? What makes it important to them? First of all, as I mentioned, a long history. That's a picture of Mount Ararat. That's today in the Republic of Turkey, but historically it's um, uh, within the confines of where Armenians lived. Um, and the, the mountain is a potent symbol for them. Uh, of course, within uh, the Jewish Christian tradition, it's also where um, the Noah's Ark uh, came to, to, to rest. That wasn't the original mountain that moved there eventually when people realized that was the tallest mountain in the region. Uh, but tradition um, does have Noah's Ark now um, come to rest there. So Armenians are very proud of the long history they have and connected to this um, region um, where they now no longer live. Um, their Christian faith is also very important to them. Uh, they converted early at the beginning of the fourth century as a, as a, as a people. Um, the king converted in, in 314 approximately. Church says 301, I'm not going to quibble. Um, the, and over the next centuries, the population converted um, as well. They have their own church. Uh, it's in communion with the Roman Catholic Church, but it's their own separate church with their own head of, uh, the head of their own church, which is known as the Catholicos. Um, and their headquarters are in Armenia at a, uh, uh, at a city called Etchmiadzin. Um, and that's their Vatican city, the equivalent of their Vatican uh, for the Armenian church. And they have their own, obviously they have their own language, but they also have their own alphabet, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, they invented their own alphabet in 406. They still use it to this day. So it's over 1,600 years of a continuous literary tradition. It has 36 letters. Um, and uh, it's great because the letters doubles, double as numbers. So this column is the ones column. This is the tens, hundreds, and then finally the thousands. So you can write a number up to... 9,999. Uh, when you get to 10,000, it's just a lot. So you don't have to worry. <laughs> you don't have to worry writing about that. Down. It's not great for math, but it's good for, I mean, it's a little hard to say, you know, GK plus ID doesn't really lend itself to math, but it, it is good for, um, uh, it, it is good for, let's say, when you, if you look at volumes and books, when they label the volumes and books, if you have 10 volumes, they'll use the, these letters. So it'll be volume A, volume B, volume G. Um, so, um, they still use that alphabet today, uh, and it's, it's, it's one of the rare instances where we actually know the person who invented it and why they invented it. Most people, for most languages, either you don't have, like, English doesn't use its own alphabet, right? It's based off of the Latin alphabet, and that's why we have all these weird letter combinations that don't seem to make any sense. It's not made for our, for the English language. Um, Armenian was made, so one letter gets one sound, uh, ideally. And um, they, uh, we know that the inventor, Mesrop Mashtots, uh, invented the alphabet in 406 in order for the Bible to be translated into Armenian. So we have that story, and it's, it's very useful. Okay, so that's how these are like the important factors. And one other thing is the homeland dispersion dichotomy. So Armenians live all around the world. Uh, the population statistics aren't exact, but there are about 10 million Armenians worldwide and about two million Armenians, or to three million Armenians in the Republic of Armenia. All right, so Armenians are an international people, a global people. They're everywhere from South America uh, to Asia to the United States, obviously North America and Europe, right? um, and, and also in Africa. There was a community in Egypt and in Ethiopia. Um, but they all are tied 
to uh, this idea of a homeland uh, where uh, the majority of Armenians lived historically. And we'll talk about that in a second, which the majority of which is in um, uh, the Republic of Turkey today. And the Republic of Armenia represents only a very, about one-tenth of the historical um, landscape of where Armenians used to live. Okay, so where is Armenia, having talked about that? This is, put that there, boom. Um, this is a map of the former Soviet republics. After the Soviet Union broke up, the Republic of Armenia used to be a Soviet Socialist Republic. In 1991, it gained its independence. And you can see it's, it's located here directly to the, bad with directions, east of Turkey, south of Georgia, west of Azerbaijan, and north of Iran. In other words, it's a tough neighborhood. Um, not one. I mean, it's ideal for certain things, but it, they have rough neighbors and they have rough relations. Actually, the, their best relations are with the Republic of Iran, where they actually have very good um, um, economic and political ties. Uh, despite the, uh, the difference in religion, um, they actually get along quite well and they have a shared historical tradition that goes back many centuries. Um, but you can see it's quite small. Historical Armenia used to come all the way out to here. So it would take up this entire area as opposed to um, just this right here. And you'll see it here. These are the Armenian provinces in the 19th to 20th centuries before the genocide in the Ottoman Empire. So it would go pretty much all the way halfway. And I mean, that's not the, there were Armenians living in other places as well. But this, this area is historically where most Armenians had lived. By the 19th century, um, they were not necessarily a majority in all of these places. But um, they were in Vaughan, they were a majority, and most of them, they were a, uh, a, pl a plurality, and in, uh, and in a few, they were just the largest minority. But nonetheless, this is the historical, um, I would say, living area of the Armenian people um, in, in the region. Okay. So Armenians in the Ottoman Empire and the Armenian Genocide. And one of the things uh, that we should look at is that um, Armenians have been on the move uh, uh, for a while, um, and the Ottoman Empire for, you know, it was not great to live in the Ottoman Empire, but the Armenians did fairly well, right? I mean, it was better than in other places. So in the 16th century, the Ottomans captured uh, Western Armenia, and in the 18th century, many Armenians start to move to Constantinople. That's the, capitals, uh, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, and in the 18th and 19th century, this is um, this is like a bustling, huge metropolis. It's former Constantinople. Istanbul, Constantinople was the former capital of the Byzantine Empire. You have layers upon layers of, of history there. You have, it's, a, it's a large city. It's an economically active city. It's a beautiful city um, with many differing architectural styles and many different ethnic groups. I mean, many languages uh, were, uh, uh, were present there. And because it's the economic hub, much as we see today as people are moving to urban centers in order to make a living, so too did a lot of the, um, uh, the Armenians in, in, in Western Armenia start, um, in the Eastern Empire, started to move uh, west uh, to the capital. And this was because of the political economic situation in the Eastern part of the empire was, was de um, deteriorating due to wars between the Ottoman Empire and the Iranian Safavid Empire, as well as revolts within the Ottoman Empire itself. So a lot of Armenians decided it's not worth living out here anymore, let's move to the capital. And by the 19th century, what develops is a affluent urban Armenian um, middle class, middle and upper class. Um, and they hold important positions in the government as well. They're the head of the, uh, uh, of the paper mill, that, where they make the currency. They're the head of the gunpowder mill for, the, um, uh, uh, for supplying the military. Um, they, they are often bankers, and they support a lot of the government officials by giving them loans. Um, they're the imperial architects uh, who design much of 19th century Constantinople. The architects were often uh, Armenians. Um, uh, who uh, designed the palaces. Um, so if you're living in the 19th century, particularly from 1850 onwards, and you're Armenian and you're living in Constantinople, right, this is a wonderful period. It's probably the best place you can live in the world and it looks like things are moving in the right direction. There's always been a problem. Christians in the Ottoman Empire were second class citizens, but there were a series of reforms that were put in in the 19th century um, a lot of it was imposed by European colonial powers 
wanting to um, control uh, Christian interests in, in the Ottoman Empire, but there was also, there were reformists within the Ottoman Empire who also saw this as a good thing. And these reforms were meant to increase education. They were meant to increase transport. They were meant to liberalize the economy. They were to protect private property. Um, they were to give people rights regardless of their faith. So these uh, reforms made life a lot easier uh, for Armenians, particularly in these Western urban um, areas where they started to do quite well and move up the socioeconomic ladder. In the provinces, however, where they left, right, or where the majority of them were still living, it was a different issue. Because the mass of people out here were still agricultural peasants, there were artisans, people had local trades, but the mass of people were farmers. Um, and farming was absolutely uh, essential for them. Right? And there were the reforms that had done so much for Armenians in the urban centers had very little impact in these more rural centers or rural areas. Right? And we have reports that you sort of get two Armenias in the Ottoman Empire sort of um, uh, emerging. One, this affluent urban class that's very comfortable um, in Ottoman society, and this rural uh, Armenian class that feels totally abandoned. Um, the, the reforms are not implemented. Many of the, much of the local population resents the reforms because they don't see this as creating equality. What they see it as is bringing their status down. Um, and so they, they have no interest in actually um, putting these reforms into place. Um, at the same time, uh, there are uh, Muslim emigres from uh, Europe, as the Ottoman Empire starts losing territory, particularly in the Balkans and in the Caucasus, to the Russian Empire in the Caucasus and to the Greek independence um, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire in Europe, many of the, their Muslim subjects in those areas say, we're not going to stay here under Christian rule, and they start moving into the heartland of the Ottoman Empire, and they say, give us land. A lot of them are settled in this area. All right, where they hope to um, dilute the Armenian population or dilute the Christian presence by putting in these uh, Muslim refugees. But part of the problem is they did not have the historical ties with the Armenian community that many of the local inhabitants did. And it also created a sort of um, competition for resources. All right, it's not, if you ever travel there, it's, it's not easy. This is not where you're just picking uh, food off of trees in an easy, uh, easy manner. It's hard. It's, I mean, the, the land is arable, but it is difficult. Um, and it's not as though there's a superabundance uh, so that you could just ramp up production um, of these resources for an increased population. So we start to see competition for resources amongst the different groups. Um, and uh, the Armenians feel a sense of lawlessness and abandonment. And they write, they write to Constantinople, they write to the, uh, the Ottoman officials saying, will you please send somebody out here to put things in, keep things in check? Can you make sure that the laws that you're passing are actually implemented out here? All right? And that actually doesn't happen. The Ottoman Empire is not successful in bringing it in under control. And what you do get are Armenians out there sort of forming their own um, uh, relief groups, trying to help each other, banding together, um, in order to protect uh, their, their property and their families. Um, as I said, the Armenians are a majority in Van, in this area. There are a uh, plurality in these and in a minority, but the largest minority in some of them. So we start to see this, and this is important because what happens is that the Armenian intellectual and economic elite in, the, in Constantinople and in the western urban areas don't really have a good sense of what's going, out, go, going on out here. And they get very different um, uh, sort of, um, let's say, reactions uh, to what, what's happening. Now, in 1908, um, things seem to be moving towards the better again. There's a coup. The Sultan, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, had pretty much annoyed everybody in the empire. He, had, he was pretty psycho. Um, he, he suffered, he was paranoid. Um, and uh, he had managed to really um, er create an entire uh, group of disaffected uh, inhabitants of the empire from all ethnic groups. There were Turks, including his own nephew, um, Arab community, 
um, Jewish community, the Greek community, the Armenian community. Most of them left the Ottoman Empire. Um, I mean, a lot of these people, the, the intellectuals, left the Ottoman Empire for Europe um, at the end of the 19th century um, and tried to force change upon the empire from the outside. And in 1908, there was actually a coup, and he was overthrown. And this was really heralded as a great moment in Ottoman history. The idea was that they would then be able to install a constitutional sultanate, some, something like what England had, a constitutional monarchy, um, where we would have a sultan, but um, uh, with, a, with an actual constitution. And the young Turk constitutional government is formed, and Armenians are a part of it. And now it really seems like we're moving towards some sense of normalcy, that the, the discrimination against Armenians possibly now would start uh, 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 abating. Um, Armenians are fully part of the government. They're able to fight in the armed forces. They're able to carry weapons. Um, they're becoming part of, uh, full, fully part of, of civil society. Uh, but there are problems lurking. The military nationalists, known as the Committee of Union and Progress, remain dissatisfied. What, what, they, what particularly irks them is that democracies, as you may know, are not necessarily the most efficient forms of government. Right? I mean, for better or for worse, democracies have a hard time doing things quickly because you're supposed to debate them and you're supposed to contest them and you go back and forth and it's very hard to make a single decision and just say, go for it. Um, militaries, on the other hand, like direct orders where you can do something and go and get it done and be efficient. And so many of the military leaders were disaffected with this whole structure, particularly as the Ottoman Empire continued to lose uh, military engagements uh, with European uh, forces in the Eastern Mediterranean. And so they themselves um, for, stage a counter coup in 1913. Um, they take over control of the government, they shoot a couple of the ministers, and, in, and impose martial law. Uh, the leaders of this, um, we call it, of, 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 the, of the coup, we call them the triumvirate, um, and it was Enver Pasha, the minister of war, Talat Pasha, the Minister of the Interior, and the person who would actually put into place the policy of the genocide, um, and Jemal Pasha, the Minister of the Navy. All right, so they take over in 1913, um, and there is still some debate as to whether they had already had in their minds when they took power in 1913 um, that they were going to exterminate the Armenians or not. Um, it's unclear. Uh, it seems likely that they did but it's uncertain. We're not exactly sure. Um, what does happen, however, is that uh, the, the Ottoman Empire is eking to get into the, uh, really itchy to get into the war, World War I. And it's, it's hard for us to believe now, but people wanted to get into World War I. Um, because they thought, A, they thought it was going to be quick. I mean, people normally think wars are going to be quick, but they thought it was going to be quick um, and that there were going to be large gains, territorial gains. And in Germany, was allied uh, with the Ottoman Empire. One of the reasons being Germany, having come to the imperialist game late, the colonialist game late, always felt you know, a little left out by what um, England, Holland, and France had been able to do in terms of getting colonial provinces, realized it wasn't able to go anymore to North or South America to steal raw materials and bring them back and turn them into vast amounts of cash at home. Right? So what they decided was they would, they would work with the Ottoman Empire. And they sent a lot of men, um, in particular, but whole families, men and women, to the Ottoman Empire to train um, the Ottoman troops to give them weapons. They built a railroad that, went, that was supposed to go from Berlin to Baghdad. Um, this was all in the hopes of um, having some sort of imperial presence in the Middle East, and in, and in particular in the Ottoman Empire, which also then meant having it um, all through um, what we would say is the Levant, and so Syria, in um, Lebanon today and in Israel and Jerusalem, which of course for uh, Germany was also important. Um, so they were very much, um, they were very close to the Ottoman Empire um, and they knew that the Ottoman Empire was going to side with them in World War I, but they actually didn't want them to enter the war. And the Ottomans sort of, because they didn't think the Ottoman Empire was actually militarily ready and they didn't want to open up another front with the Russians um, uh, in World War I, and so they actually asked the Ottoman Empire to not, en not enter, um, but the Ottomans themselves, uh, and particularly um, uh, Enver Pasha, really wanted to get in. And the dream was to create a giant Turkey connecting 
the Turkish province of the Ottoman, of the Ottoman Empire with all the way to the Pacific. Because between the Mediterranean and the Pacific, all of those peoples in Central Asia, right, a large amount of them are Turkic. Turkic speaking, they're Turkic peoples. They're not Turkish in the sense of how we, we would say somebody is Turkish, but they are Turkic. Um, and the idea of the triumvirate was they could create a giant pan-Turkish empire that would link all of these Turkic peoples together and it would go from the Mediterranean and Constantinople all the way across into the Caucasus and then over um, uh, to the Pacific. Um, of course, one of the problems was in between uh, those Turkic people who probably had no idea that this was the Ottoman <laughs> intent and uh, the Ottoman Empire itself were places like Russia and uh, Armenia and the Armenian people. So uh, Enver Pasha decides to, at the beginning of the war, lead a major campaign to the east, a sort of a blitzkrieg through, um, uh, through the Caucasus and then over into Central Asia. However, he gets stopped at the Battle of Sarikamish in, in 1915, in January. He loses nearly his entire army. They freeze to death. Um, none of the animals even make it back because they had to eat them or kill them or they died. Um, and it's a huge embarrassment and it's a military disaster. Um, he, uh, several uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of men died. And on the way back, he immediately starts to blame Armenians for betraying the, uh, the Ottoman troops. Um, and therefore, uh, that they need to be punished. And very soon after this, the, uh, the beginnings of the genocide are put into motion. So, first of all, in February 1915, uh, disarmament order goes out. Armenians are no longer allowed to hold weapons, um, and there were searches and seizures of Armenian houses throughout the provinces. So many Armenians had guns. And at this point, Armenians were able to serve in the military. Those in the military were taken out of infantry units and put into work details. Uh, so they were disarmed and put into work details where they either, um, they continued building the railroad, uh, they dug tunnels, um, they were tailors. Uh, one, uh, there's a story of one gentleman who survived because he faked knowing how to play the bugle and the Turkish regiment he was in needed a bugler and so he managed to pick it up fast enough that they didn't kill him um, uh, and that's how he survived the genocide. But so the army, the, the, men, the people who were in the army were disarmed and put into work details. But people at home also had weapons because they used to hunt. That's how they would get their food often, is by hunting. And there was house-to-house -house searches, and if you were found to have a weapon, you were arrested. Um, and that was another way of, uh, of sort of disturbing the population early on. Um, in April 8th, based on this, Armenians of the Zaytun region were deported. Um, then on April 19th, there were massacres in the Van region. And as we said, on April 24th, approximately 250 leaders in Constantinople are arrested and nearly all of them are killed soon thereafter. And by 1916, over 1 million are dead and 500,000 people are displaced. And so you can see it moves very quickly. And that's part of the reason for thinking that um, Enver Pasha did not just come up with this idea on one snowy day retreating back from Sarikamish in January because immediately they're able to put this plan into action and it's within a, in a, within a few months um, they're able to start the killing. Okay. By 1923, one and a half million people are dead, 500,000 are displaced. Um, there are also a number of Armenians who um, converted or particularly if they were women and children, um, they were either brought into um, either Kurdish or Arab and sometimes Turkish houses converted and raised as Turks and Kurds, as Muslims. Um, sometimes they were married, if they were of, of, you know, 13 or older, they were often married to somebody, they were taken as a wife, um, and therefore they survived. Um, sometimes they had a cross tattooed on them, and so they knew later. Um, there, there have been interviews with several of these, uh, particularly women, who, uh, in, who were in their 90s started to talk about their Armenian heritage um, that had been silent for, for decades. Um, as they got new names. Um, and so right now, actually, within Turkey, there's an interesting sort of movement, and particularly amongst the Kurdish population, since a lot of this happened with Kurds, uh, about finding like an Armenian grandparent, that their grandmother, or they knew their grandmother was 
Armenian, but nobody ever talked about it. But more recently, that's come out in the open. So we don't actually know how many Armenians stayed within um, the Ottoman Empire, but became Muslim and disappeared into the general population. Um, okay. So here's a map that shows, um, I think, dramatically the, the, the change in the Armenian uh, population of the Ottoman Empire. So this is, you can see the red, the darker the red, the more people there are. This is 1914, I think this will show up. That's 1926. So you can see it's pretty much eliminated, all of it. Um, I just back, so that's 1914, and then less than 10 years, or just 12 years later in 1926, um, uh, that's what we have. So the entire culture is wiped out. Um, it's not, I mean, obviously the people are wiped out, the villages are wiped out, um, but the, the cultural loss is also huge. Uh, Armenians at that time were the one at the forefront of Ottoman cultural production, whether it was in music, whether it was in literature, whether it was in the arts, and all of that disappeared overnight. Um, likewise, the wealth, the Armenian wealth, as we'll, say, uh, uh, as we'll see, um, was redistributed. Um, to different populations. So all of their uh, possessions were taken and then uh, re and get taken by the state, owned by the state, and then re redistributed. Um, and we'll get to that in a, in a second as well. So let's look at genocide and modernity. As I mentioned this earlier, that actually the Armenian genocide goes hand in hand with um, the emergence of modernity. So genocide is a human-made disaster that we must confront as part of our modern and post-modern existence. And here are the negative aspects that go with that. Right? I mean, modernity, I could say, you know, in a lot of ways, has been great, but also in this respect has been terrible. As we'll see, is the paradigm of genocide um, that is indicative of the way the Armenian genocide was um, carried out and then has been followed ever since. The use of technology even at the beginning of the 20th century, technology was key to the implementation of the genocide. And then finally, the legalization of genocide. And this is interesting, the very fact that you need to pass laws to do this, which you wouldn't think. I mean, historically, I mean, the Mongols didn't really pass laws to kill people. They killed people when they came across a village that resisted. But here, there's an actual legal structure put into place right, to ensure that what happened to the Armenians is not only, you know, not only succeeded, but was legally correct. And that the property that was taken was legally appropriated by the state. Um, so those are the negatives. The positives, on the other hand, are internationalization. This is something we're, we're well, you know, is familiar to us. When something bad happens, all of a sudden, you know, you start to hear about it, we can crowdfund it, they have fundraisers, uh, politicians get involved, celebrities get involved, and all of a sudden the entire world tries to come together to help um, a group of people, right? So that's, we see this in the Armenian Genocide. Relief efforts, too, this, the idea that, you know, you can do something. It's not just that you sit back and say, oh, those poor people, but you can actually mobilize and try and help. And also that rescuers, that people saw this in, Coming to the realization, hey, we can help, many people actually did. Individuals, not necessarily always big countries, but individuals risked their life right, to do what was right and to help people. And, and, and these, these, I would say, are the positive aspects of uh, the modern condition uh, of genocide. So let's look at the paradigm of genocide. First of all, Armenians were denigrated. I think, uh, Probably most of you have read about the steps uh, of genocide uh, in the class, in, in the reading, but, and these are uh, all present in the Armenian genocide as well. They were depicted as a disease, as a, verb, as a vermin. They were corrupting you know, Turkish um, purity. Uh, they were weakening the state. They were traitors. They were like rats. Um, they were like bugs that needed to be squashed, um, and they had to be gotten rid of. Right? And then there was a pattern to that extermination. And here's a map. The, the giant red dots are where, where the most uh, people were killed, uh, centers of killing. Um, and then the lines are the, how the deportation routes that the women and children were put on. So men were gathered, and that we, we have this time and time again. Men were gathered, held, and marched out of town. Um, and then they were shot, or if they wanted to save bullets, they were bayoneted. 
Sometimes they were marched to the, one, to the first town and they were told to write letters back to their families to say that they were okay. After they did that, they were taken out and shot. Um, but they didn't want to create a panic amongst the people who were left behind who they came for next. Right? So first they got rid of the, uh, the male population. Then they, the elderly women and children were told they had to leave because they were in the sphere of war. Right? As you can see, it's through the entire country and it was only the, the Armenians uh, who were told to leave uh, in many of these places, um, not the Turkish um, uh, uh, inhabitants of the region or the Kurdish ones, um, but they were told to leave because it was dangerous for them. And many of these were marched through the deserts towards Aleppo, then along the Euphrates to places like Deir Zor. So they were marched from here, they went down to Syria and then into the desert. Okay, and we have, you know, written accounts by Turkish soldiers, Arab soldiers in the Turkish army, writing home saying, I don't know what we're doing. We've been marching this group of people around in the desert for months in a circle, right? I did not enlist in the army to listen to old women complain about walking in the desert. I mean, these are people, who, these are young men who wanted to fight, and they don't understand why they're doing this. They weren't told that this was part of a larger plan of extermination. They were just told, you're going to escort these people into the desert. And then they would get more orders, keep walking them around in the desert, right, until they drop dead, basically. All right. And we'll talk about also in Deir Zor, it was, a, was basically a concentration camp. That's where they then gathered them all together um, and uh, they, just, they, they allowed uh, disease to take root and, and most of the population uh, that were held in those camps uh, died. Um, and also here we have, uh, not only was there a pattern, but as I mentioned, there's simultane simultaneity. Right? Between April and August 1915, the Armenians of nearly every major town and village were deported. So this was not, you know, one guy in one place thinking, hey, I want to get rid of these people, right? This was coordinated, right? It wasn't local people taking matters into their own hands or worried about things. This, these were directives that were coming from the center to the periphery. Okay. And technology, therefore, was essential, right? The telegraph was used to communicate the orders. Telegraph, which was relatively new then, um, you know, they, they would communicate the orders to the periphery from the center using the telegraph. Likewise, the new railway lines that the Germans had helped build, uh, the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad, were used to transport Armenians into the desert as well. And oftentimes what happened were the Armenians were first made to pay for their rail ticket out of town, then they were packed in these cars, which may be eerily familiar to people who also know the history of the Holocaust, um, the, car, the trains were then often stopped in the middle of nowhere, the people told to get off, and then they were shot. Right? Obviously, even the conditions within the cars, a lot of them died just in the transport because they, were, it was, they overheated, there was no water, they were locked into the cars, um, they were overcrowded. Right? So, uh, we see the use, though, of this transportation of being, so they didn't just only march them, they also used the railways to try to get them out. There was a special organization, it's known as the Special Organization Tur in Turkish, Tashkilat Masusa, was established with the sole directive of overseeing this operation. All right. So significant government resources were I would say appropriated and were deployed in order to make sure that this policy was executed and completed. Right. And as I mentioned, Ar Armenians were gathered in concentration camps. Um, and this is like a new, um, I mean, we've known for a while that they were put into concentration camps, particularly along the Euphrates River as they were marched um, to Deir Zor, the biggest one. Uh, but there are new studies coming out about what life was like in those camps, which is, has been relatively unstudied. Um, and one of the things is it seems that the, uh, the Ottomans also used the system of having a capo, that you pick one family or group of families in each camp and you make them the ruling family of that camp. You give them the best of everything in the camp and you rely upon them to keep the camp sort of 
uh, settled, right, and, and not become unruly. So they did this. But then they would move them from camp to camp. And so whoever was the ruling family in camp one would now be put at the bottom of the hierarchy in camp two. And the people who were at the lower end at camp one were now placed at the top of the hierarchy in camp two. Right? So you can imagine how the people who were treated pretty badly in camp one felt when they got to camp two and now they were running the camp. Right? I mean, obviously they're running the camp, quote unquote. I don't mean that they actually have any real agency. They're also you know, under guard and, and also slated for execution. But the relative power difference would have been stark. Right? And this was a way to keep also the Armenians against each other in these camps. As again, they're fighting for food and water right? and, and, and a place to sleep, not near where you go to the bathroom. These, you know, these very basic but important elements in our life that they would set one group of people against another as they moved them from camp to camp until uh, they were killed. Um, so we see this already. And we also know that there were German soldiers who witnessed this, who witnessed the construction of the camps, who uh, witnessed what the, what the, uh, 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 both uh, the use of the railway, and who also uh, oversaw um, how the Ottoman Empire was executing its um, Armenian population. And it's not surprising, they, they, they tended to be soldiers, but it's not surprising that in World War II, some of those soldiers became camp directors in the Holocaust. That they were the actual soldiers then put in charge of the death camps in the Holocaust. And, and having been trained um, in their youth um, in, the, in the Ottoman killing fields. And then as I mentioned, the legalization of genocide. Between May and December of 1915, Right, there, there was a series of laws passed that, one, authorized the deportation of Armenians. Right? There was an actual official decree saying Armenians had to go. Right? And it secured and registered the property of Armenians while relocated. So they told them, look, you're going. We want a list. You can't take anything with you. So please make out a list of everything that's in your house so that when you come back, we can give it back to you. Okay. That was the idea, and there was one copy. We know some of this because there were two copies made. One copy went to Istanbul, to Constantinople, to the capital, and one copy stayed in the local area. Now, the ones that are in the capital, I don't think you can access. Not many people have had success. Either they were destroyed, or they're not letting people see them. But in the provincial areas, some of those libraries, some of the archives there still have them in a box. They just never did anything with them. And so some scholars have been able to find them these actual lists of Armenian properties inventoried that they're supposed to get. But after they did that list, they sh shortly thereafter created an abandoned properties administration commission that had to report every 15 days to the Ministry of the Internal Affairs. What did that mean? That said, like, if somebody didn't come back within an X amount of time to claim that property, it was declared abandoned. And once it was declared abandoned, it became the property of the state. So they took over this entire swath of property, of businesses, of cash, of precious metals, over pretty much overnight, because they knew that nobody was coming back. Right? And then they administered the liquidation of Armenian properties and actually created a liquidation commission. That is, again, the government set up a regularized, method of how to handle the property of people who simply disappeared and for some reason decided to leave everything they had behind. Right? But we don't know what happened to them. Right? According to Talat Pasha's own accounts, and this was found on him when he died, he was shot by a, an Armenian in Berlin who recognized him and assassinated him um, in broad daylight. Uh, he was actually uh, Sohamon Tehlirian. He's buried in Fresno. You can go to his, uh, you can go to his grave site. Um, and he was then put on trial in Germany, um, and he was found not guilty because of what the Ottomans had done to the Armenians. They said it was justifiable. Um, and so he didn't actually have to serve 
uh, um, jail time. It's actually quite interesting. The Germans themselves tried not to have a lot advertised about the Armenian genocide while it was happening. They knew it was going on. They had hints that it was going on, but they didn't want it to get out because they were afraid the German populace would not stand for such barbarity that they would want to then break their treaty with the Ottoman Empire and break off the alliance because the Germans would be horrified that people were doing this. Um, it's amazing how quickly things change. But, so according to Talat Pasha's own accounts that they found on him when he, when he was, uh, after he was shot, he carried this in a little book. He had listed 20,545 buildings, 267,536 acres of land, Almost 77,000 acres of vineyards, 700 and almost 4,000 acres of olive groves, and 4,573 acres of mulberry gardens had been confiscated. Right? And he kept that with him. Right? Because he was like, this is, this is like the proof of the good deeds that he had done. Um, so we, we, uh, uh, we have this sort of legal uh, structure put into place for the deportation and appropriation of Armenian property. Now on the positive side, as I said, internationalization. I said Germany tried to keep this under wraps, but America actually knew quite well. Right? A lot of people say, oh, the genocide happened because nobody knew, you know, it was out there in the Ottoman Empire, nobody knew about it, it was in the middle of nowhere. Not true. It was the most famous issue of the day. Right? Between nearly 200 articles in the New York Times between 1915 and 1922, Right? We also had the reports of the American ambassador to Turkey. America was neutral in World War I for most of the war. And you know, as, as the, the positive side of this was that we actually had a, 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 an embassy in Constantinople and we had a consul, a consuls throughout the Ottoman Empire. And they wrote saying, something really bad is going on. Right? And Henry Morgenthau um, and, and these consuls and American missionaries as well wrote saying, listen, we have to, this has to stop. They're, they're, they, he said it's the extinction of a people because the word genocide hadn't been invented yet. Right? They're, they're mass killings. They're, and he tried, he had an interview with Talat Pasha um, and they asked him, uh, you know, why, you know, at least the women and the children, why are you killing them? And he said, what, well, what do you think will happen if one of those boys grows up? Do you think they're just going to let us do this? Right? So he feared revenge, so everybody had to be killed. Right? You couldn't let anybody left. Um, and then in 1933, Franz Werfel's 40 Days of Musadach um, was this fictionalized account of an actual, um, uh, an, an actual siege uh, uh, on Musadach, a mountain in south eastern Turkey, um, where Armenians uh, fought against the Ottoman Empire um, and were able to hold off Ottoman troops long enough to be rescued uh, by French warships that were just off the coast. Um, and then he turned this into a, uh, into a best-selling no uh, novel that was then translated into a number of languages. It was slated to become a film, but the State Department called up MGM and said, don't do it. So it got pushed off um, because they didn't want to anger Turkey. And we'll get to this in a minute as well. So, but it was a cause celebre of the day, and it brought about relief efforts. Uh, because of this, the, uh, uh, the American Committee for Relief in the Near East, which is the Near East uh, Relief Fund, um, had this huge, huge fund drive. And between 1916 and 1930, the U.S. raised $116 million in relief money. That is now $2.5 billion in today's dollars. It's the largest relief effort ever larger than anything we've ever done since for anyone, all right? It's huge, all right? It's the largest relief effort ever. And this is one of the things, as I said, in the U.S. resolution, it said we need to highlight the United States' involvement in this. Because one of the things that was so annoying about the gag policy that Turkey pretty much imposed on us was that Americans didn't get to learn about their own history. A good thing that America did in the 1900s, nobody knew, that, nobody studied this in high school, right? One person? No. Nobody learned about this. Nobody, everybody knows Babe Ruth, baseball player, famous baseball player, right? He auctioned off one of his baseball bats that hit a home run to help Armenian orphans, right? This is the first time that politicians, 
including the president, several former presidents um, uh, as well, celebrities, got together to raise money for a relief effort. What we consider now normal, right, for any relief effort, where you get a, uh, somebody famous to come up and talk about it and hope to raise money, you go door to door and try and raise money by, or phone-a-thons, they would go door to door, they'd have mail-ins. This starts with American efforts uh, to help the Armenian orphans, um, in particular, uh, the survivors of the Armenian genocide. Um, we also have, as I said, individual rescuers who do a lot. In particular, there are Danish missionaries, M M uh, Maria Jakobsen and Karen Jeppe, um, uh, uh, saved, set up orphanages um, in the Middle East to take in um, Armenian children. And then somebody who may be uh, sort of familiar to people, Steve Kerr's grandfather, Stanley Kerr. Uh, you know, the warriors aren't doing so well now, but you know, in years past, people always thought this was great. His grandfather was, um, was an American missionary in the Ottoman Empire, and um, they organized uh, support groups, uh, particularly, again, for orphans, but also for women um, who were left uh, after the killing. And you also had righteous Turks and Kurds. And the, and the quotes there, just as, as the technical, it's not meaning sarcastic. It, it means, I mean, they, they, these are people who tried to help. Right, so they, and they come in different uh, groups, right? There are elites, right? People who were supposed to put this, these policies into action didn't, right? Or they delayed as long as possible. They just said, look, I'm not going to do this. Or they told the Armenians, look, man, get out now because I've had orders that I, we're going to have to take you out and kill you, so just leave. Um, uh, because, you know, a lot of Armenians had very close, and especially... The wealthy Armenians and the ones who were in these urban centers were very close to the Turkish political elite. And a lot of them were astounded. They're like, listen, we just, last year, I just helped you get into power. What's going on? We've, like, eaten dinner together once a week for the past six years. What, what's happening? And they're like, sorry. Um, so it was really traumatic in that way because this was at the moment in which Armenians felt the most integrated into Ottoman society. And here they were now being uh, expelled uh, and executed. Some hit Armenians. Um, some provided food on the marches. And then some adopted them. I mean, this is, you know, this is a little bit less positive, but they did save people's lives. But as I said, they would, as these, particularly women and children, were going through the desert, there would be groups of men who would come up and say, I want her and I want him, and they would be taken out of line and they were brought back to be used um, you know, either as uh, you know, somebody to serve in the household or to marry or as an adopted child. Sometimes this was done with good intent where they actually adopted children for the, you know, because they, they felt sorry for them and they, and they raised them um, as their own. Uh, but also there, were, there was a lot of just you know, taking, stealing people um, as well. Uh, but uh, they did save them uh, in that way. Okay, Turkish denialism. None of this happened. That's number one. Systematic, large-scale atrocities did not occur. Right? And originally, that's basically what they said. It just never happened. I once traveled on a uh, Turkish Airways flight. Um, I was going to uh, uh, Istanbul. And there was a section in the travel magazine, in the in-air in uh, 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 in you know, flight magazine, sort of innocuous enough, and they had this special section on Akhlat. Akhlat's a town on Lake Van, Khlat in Armenian, Akhlat in Turkish. Um, and I had studied in my own studies many people from there, monks, scholars, uh, inhabitants of, of that region. And they had this whole 5,000 history of the town of Akhlat starting with the Sumerians, down to the present day. They didn't once mention Armenians. Never existed. They weren't there. Went to Van, and I don't know if this is still the case, but when I was there last, they have a, a museum in Van, and they have a wing dedicated to the Armenian genocide. And you're like, oh, wow. And then you realize when you go in, it's a wing devoted to the Turkish people who were killed by Armenians. When they say the Armenian genocide, they mean the genocide committed by Armenians against the Turks. And in the, basically the room is like a bunch of skulls. 
and that these are the Turkish martyrs who died at the hands of the bloody Armenians. It's, it's really weird to go in there, and you're sort of looking around saying, well, why aren't there any here now? Um, uh, so you have that as well. So there was once complete denial. First, that Armenians ever lived there, and then they realized that's a little bit tough to uh, maintain. Then the genocide never happened, but again, people said, well, then where are these people if it never happened? We know there are about two million to two and a half million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire around 1910. Where did they go? So the next line became, yes, no, you know, it was World War I. It was confusing. We tried to get them out of the way of the war, and things happened. But it wasn't organized. It wasn't this many people. It wasn't 1.5 million people. It was just a few people. And then other Ar Armenians decided to just leave, right, because they didn't want to stay in Turkey. Um, other ones say the Armenians deserved it, right? Yes, we killed them, but that's because they were traitors and revolutionaries. And um, you can see this is President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey in April of this year. Right? He said the relocation of the Armenian gangs and their supporters who massacred the Muslim people, including women and children in eastern Anatolia, was the most reasonable action that could be taken in such a period. Right? Notice he just says relocation. One of the, <laughs> relocation to where, he doesn't say. Where were they relocated to? The desert, okay. Um, one, <laughs> one interesting fact was there was a Turkish historian who actually denies that the genocide happened. But he's an economic historian, and he noted that 800,000 people dropped off the tax rolls in 1915, after 1915, when you went to 1916. And he says, yes, no, that's the Arme those are the Armenians who dis disappeared. He just doesn't think a genocide happened. Um, so that's another line of attack, right? Um, they also then say there's discontinuity. This is a little bit more subtle. Discontinuity basically says, oh, Armenians were killed. It wasn't a genocide, but they were killed um, because it was the heat of war, and they deserved it because they were traitors, and they were killing us, right? But in any case, the Republic of Turkey is not responsible for this because it happened under the Ottoman Empire. Right? Um, and despite the fact that the wealth of the Republic of Turkey is built you know, partially upon that of appropriating Armenian properties, uh, despite the fact that many of the people who took part in the Armenian genocide went on to have flourishing political careers right, in the Republic of Turkey afterwards. Um, it's not as though everybody was punished. There was a court that was, it's interesting, there was a court that held um, uh, immediately after the war that took in the Armenian case and all three of the, the Pashas, of the triumvirate, Enver, Talat, and Jemal Pasha were found guilty of uh, committing crimes against humanity and uh, of betraying the Turkish nation by killing the Armenians. But that was a British, that was a court that was held, they were Ottoman judges, but it was sort of held under British supervision and before the Republic of Turkey was, um, uh, 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 was established. And all three of them went into exile. And all three of them eventually were killed by Armenians um, in different circumstances. Um, so we can see that this is just a few months ago. All right, that way he said that. The tactics, as I said, they're blaming others is one of them. As I said, it wasn't, um, the Armenian genocide is not Turkey's fault, it's everybody else's fault, primarily the Armenians' fault. All right. um, forgetting about it, you don't mention it, I mentioned that as well, we just don't talk about it. Right? Most importantly, and most egregiously for us, um, is prohibiting others from mentioning it. Right? They don't like other people talking about it. Right? And they try to use political blackmail, economic blackmail, religious blackmail in order to get this done. So this, for example, is written in the Istanbul Bar Association, the, one of the premier legal uh, publications of the Republic of Turkey, uh, by a supporter of Erdogan, Mustafa Shalik, who wrote, we support the 1915 Armenian expulsion. Right? This is like a, last year. Now this is not from 1915. This is from 19, 2019. Right? Anyone characterizing the expulsion as genocide is as if he were declaring war. 
Armenians and others who call it genocide risk a new expulsion. Right? And what they're talking about here is that there are about 40 to 50,000 Armenians of Turkish citizenship that stayed, in, particularly in Istanbul and the environs, after the genocide, and they're still there. There's still a Turkish-Armenian population. It's just very, very small. But even more importantly, there are a large number of Armenians from the Republic of Armenia who work in Turkey. Right? They have jobs in the construction industry. Right? And so they're saying Armenians and who call it genocide risk a new expulsion, i.e., the Republic of Armenia is going to get a couple of hundred thousand people dropped on its doorstep if they continue to push this line. Right? A step against them that would be quite easy. If we believe that there is no other way to defend our homeland and our national existence, the least that we can do is to carry out a new expulsion. Right? So again, this is not from 1915. This is from the 21st century. Right? Um, the Republic has also done a good job at sponsoring politicians and academics, endowing chairs, uh, making sure that uh, if you want access to the uh, archives, and especially, and not just, I mean, obviously it doesn't hinder Armenian uh, scholars, but scholars of the Ottoman Empire or of Turkish history um, are often threatened not to have access. They will be denied visas to uh, the Republic of Turkey. And if you're an Ottoman historian, you need access to the archives, right? And your, your, um, uh, I, I, a friend of mine, this was many years ago, the New York Times, the Armenians put uh, for April 24th had a had a, a big coverage for the anniversary of the genocide. And the Republic of Turkey responded by taking out a full page um, ad of scholars who say the genocide isn't a genocide. And a friend of mine who is a scholar, but of the 16th century, 17th century uh, Ottoman Empire, didn't sign it. Not, she said, like, look, I'm not, I'm not a scholar of this period. There's no reason for my name to be on there. I'm not a 20th century scholar. But okay. A few years later, she applied for a visa to do work in, in Istanbul and was denied. She went to the she went to the embassy and said, why was my visa denied? She said, next time we ask you to sign something, sign it. Right. And this, you know, so this sort of, when, when we went to, uh, when I traveled to Turkey, I was with an Armenian group to go to the homeland, and, and one, one of our, they were all Armenian, I'm not Armenian, but um, one of the group asked the, um, the border agent uh, who was checking our, you know, stamping our passports, uh, you realize we're Armenian. You know what we are. And he said, yeah, you're Armenian. He's like, I can tell from your names. So you don't have a problem with us coming to Turkey? He said, no, our Armenian problem is solved. Welcome to Turkey. And come on in. Spend all the money you want. So this is like a living, I mean, and there are a lot, I have to say, there are a lot of Turkish scholars. I also have friends who are Turkish scholars who can't go back to Turkey. They can't because they will be arrested. Right now, it's a particularly perilous time for intellectuals in general in Turkey, not just scholars of the Armenian Genocide, or scholars who admit that, and I don't like using the word admit, acknowledge that the genocide was a genocide, regardless of what field they're in. All right? But it is, um, there is a gag rule. And the present government is a little bit is strange, because there was hopes that when um, Erdogan was first elected, at the very beginning, that maybe he would be more open to actually acknowledging the genocide because he was not part of the military parties that basically co controlled or the main parties that basically controlled Turkish politics up until that time. And therefore, with a clean break, it was reasonable that he had no reason not to. But we'll get to this now. Why denialism? Like why, why does Turkey deny? So, and this is a cartoon um, that they often put in placards at, at Armenian demonstrations, and it's a, it's a picture of Erdogan here saying it didn't happen. That's why we get so angry when you mention it. Right? Um, so yeah, there's basically fear. The real reason for denying th is fear. Right? And what are they afraid of? One, stigma. As he said, Erdogan said, it is out of the question for there to be a stain, a shadow code ge called genocide on Turkey. So rather than being able to say, listen, this was, you know, for decades, different parties had towed this line, 
We're not that type of party. We're turning over a new leaf. We have a completely different um, approach. Um, we can talk about this now. Instead, he doubled down in many respects. Right? There's also fear of reparations. Right? What would Turkish responsibility and indemnity be? I personally don't think it would be that much and I, in, in terms of what people would settle with. I don't think an international court would give, I don't think it would bankrupt the state of Turkey. They are quite a, uh, normally they have a quite strong economy. Um, they have a large population. I don't think it would be something that would cripple them. Um, land reparations, I don't think if, I don't, you're not going to see tens of thousands of Armenian, Armenians returning to eastern Turkey. I mean, it's still not an easy place to live. I don't think they're going to leave Glendale for Diyarbakir. I, it's not going to happen. Um, and now, actually, you can buy land there now. And I know Armenians who have. They've gone back to their villages and bought land. Sometimes they'll buy a church and fix it up. You can do that. Um, so I, I don't, the reparations is a factor, but I think it's not as big of a factor. I think reparations are, is actually um, manageable, um, that it could be worked out. Uh, but I think the big reason, which is actually what Turkish scholars have told me, is the big lie and why he couldn't do it. And the big lie is, for the past 100 years, the government has told its citizens, right, this didn't happen. School books talk about how it didn't happen and how the Armenians have an international global conspiracy to get the world to admit that it did. Right? People are raised you know, from a young age knowing that this didn't happen. What happens when you tell them Oops, sorry, we made that up. It did happen. And in fact, yes, it was your grandfather or great-grandfather. And yes, the business you owned was owned by an Armenian before your family took it over. And yes, the house you lived in, right, that you grew up in, actually belonged to someone else before you got there. Right? And we never told you this before. So many Turkish scholars that I know who are pushing at the forefront of pushing for acceptance by Turkey, or a recognition of Turkey's responsibility for the Armenian Genocide, mention this as the most important factor for them, as well as for the government. For them, it's like we cannot have a republic that is built upon a lie. If it's built upon a lie, we will always have problems. Right? And for the government, it's like if they admit that it's built upon a lie, they will not survive. Right? The whole system will collapse and they'll have to rebuild again. So for both sides in this, this is the big, uh, the, let's say, this is the big nut to crack. Reparations, it's just money. You can get money, someone else can help foot the bill. Right? The stigma, even that, I mean, it's a big deal uh, for them, but they're getting a stigma anyway, so they can, uh, that would easily be blown over as well. It's this last one that really holds them up, in my opinion. Now, that's denialism. What about the politics of recognition and of denialism in addition, right? So why did it take the US until this past year to recognize it? And it's clear, every single member of, I mean, it was nearly unanimous in the, in the House of Representatives, it wasn't unanimous, but when you look at the individuals who didn't, it's very clear why, like one of them's married to someone who's Turkish, you know, there, there, there are things like that, but you know, it's overwhelming majority, and I have no doubt that every single American politician, if for, the, for definitely for the past 10, if not the past 20 years, has known that this happened, right? All the way up through the White House, right? So why did it take so long, right? Well, here are some of the reasons why we're slow to recognize, and why even though this was a non-binding resolution in the United St in the in the Senate and in the in, in the Congress, right? So it doesn't require a presidential signature. And the State Department quickly said afterwards, our position towards the Armenian Genocide or our position on this matter has not changed. They didn't say what it was. They just said, has not changed. And these are the reasons, right? Turkey is a NATO ally. Right now, our relationship with Turkey is very strained, to say the least. Um, but nonetheless, we have the Indrilik Air Force Base there, as well as the Kuritschik Kur uh, Radar Station. These are two important NATO defense systems, um, particularly against uh, the USSR, one, 
in the, in, during the Cold War, and today, Russia, it's meant as a buffer to counterbalance to hold back Russia, right? as well as within the Middle East, as we had these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Right? That, was, that was a complete, uh, convenient area uh, to be in, although they didn't always let us use the base. Right? Likewise, Turkey is a secular democ uh, democracy. And I put that in quotes because that's also being strained right now, uh, both of those terms. Uh, I, I, I'm sure many Turkish citizens would not call it a secular democracy anymore. But at least from a U.S. perspective, in the Middle East, this was considered, you know, as far back as the Obama administration, it's not that long ago, as one of the key points for our Middle Eastern policy is a successful Turkey that's a success, that is a secular democracy that should be held up as a model for the rest of the Arab world that's Muslim. Right? So that you don't have to have a theocracy and as a counterweight to Iran that has a different model. Right? So for these reasons, the United States has been unwilling to sort of annoy our friend. Right? Thinking that, um, God bless you, thinking that if we um, acknowledged it officially, they will go with the Russians, they will kick us out of the air base, they will all of a sudden become a theocracy and decide that they're going to go a different way and not try to be part of the EU, um, which they have been trying for decades unsuccessfully, right, that all of this would collapse. Right? Now, so then why all of a sudden in 2019 did we acknowledge it? Did everybody just wake up one morning? Because it really was like, I can tell you in the Senate, it was like nobody had no, any idea that they were even voting on it that day. I mean, no, the Armenian lobby, all these people who for, you know, their entire life have been arguing for this, said, what just happened? There was no lead up. There wasn't like Senate to debate this tonight. There was no debate. They passed unanimously. Is this not a St. Paul at Tarsus moment where everybody in the U.S. Senate all of a sudden realized, hey, there was an Armenian genocide. We should do something about it 105 years later. So what happened? Did all of a sudden the guilt get to them? I don't think so. They're politicians, right? So, two major things. The recognition is also political, and we should also be aware of that. This is not a stance. They did the right thing. It was unanimous. I'm glad, and like I said, I have no doubt that all of those people sincerely believe that this was a tragedy and a genocide. However, it's in reaction to, A, the Republic of Turkey buying Russian uh, missile defense systems, right, that were particularly harmful to our fighter jets. That was a no-no. And two, the incursion into Syria, which we didn't want. That's still going on to this day, if you're keeping up with the news. I know there's a lot of stuff going on now. It's a hard time to be a young person because there's a lot of things that are going on that have long histories that are very complicated, and they seem to all be bubbling up at this moment. Um, whether it's in Europe or in the Middle East um, uh, or even here in the United States, uh, it's hard to keep track of what's going on. Um, but you may be knowing that there is right now a battle going on in Idlib province between the Syrian rebels backed by Turkey against the Syrian government backed by Russia. But you can see there it's all cross-channeled cross, uh, because the, at the same time Turkey is buying a missile defense system from Russia. They're meeting now to talk about what to do. But nonetheless, don't, I mean, we have to remember that both the, the, the denial or the lack of recognition of the Armenian Genocide as well as the sudden recognition of the Armenian Genocide, as much as I would like it to be based in some sort of moral determination that this had gone on for too long, that we can't do this any longer, right? There's too much evidence this people has suffered too long under this year after year for over a century of commemorating something that we don't say happened, even though we have monuments and nearly all of our states acknowledge it, right? I wish it were from that, right? It had a, it had a place, but really it was uh, also motivated a lot to um, almost act as a slap in the face to the Republic of Turkey. So that's the less positive side of this. But the other question that remains is now what? As I said, people have devoted their lives in this country to doing just this, getting the United States to officially recognize that the Armenian Genocide happened. And one day in December, when nobody was looking, we did it. 
What do you do now? And this is the question. What do you do if you're an Armenian activist? Right? You can push for Turkish recognition. That's a little bit more difficult. Um, as uh, one a, 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 a Turkish scholar of the Armenian genocide recently, Taner Akcham, recently published a book that's advertised as like the, the shooting gun. Um, and it's the killing orders. These are the documents that he's proved just um, that verify that some documents that point towards the actual documentary evidence for the ordering of the Armenian genocide are actual valid documents, right? And, you know, he said it's going to be impossible for people to deny it now. And of course, he then said, and what happened was the Republic of Turkey turned around and just said, this is all fake. None of these are justified. None of this is legitimate. This is second-rate scholarship, and it's meaningless. So it's really hard to pressure from the outside. There's no amount of evidence that you can pile up that will make Turkey, you know, at some point recognize it. There could be political pressure, but I don't think a lot of uh, the United States or many other countries are going to put political pressure on the Republic of Turkey on this issue when there are other issues that are coming on uh, that are more of more importance to us right now. Right? So the question is, what do we do once we've recognized this? Right? One area, I'm glad that, again, that the resolution points this out, one of it is, uh, uh, okay, we continue to commemorate. Though I should let you know, the Armenian church in 2015 turned all of the victims of the genocide or, or beatified all the victims of the gen genocide, is, turned them into saints so that they can no longer be mourned because they're saints. And you don't mourn saints, you celebrate saints. And you turn to saints for help in your life. All right? And so the victims of the genocide are now supposed to be intercessors for the people who are alive today. And this was a very powerful, it was controversial. It was controversial, many Armenians were not happy about this actually. Um, but um, basically what they were saying is we can't look backwards. We can't be stuck 100 years ago you know, just mourning what we lost. We need to use what we lost 100 years ago to help us face a future, to move forward. So another way that I think a lot of younger Armenians, and this is really good, is, are, are, are making up this, this slack, is um, engaging with the Republic of Armenia. Right? There is a state since 1991, as I mentioned. Um, it needs help. It's doing very well right now. Financially, it's always in trouble. It's not a big area. It doesn't have a lot of natural resources but it has a lot of human resources. It's very literate, both in terms of reading, like actual reading, uh, as well as digitally literate. Um, and so they're trying to create a sort of digital hub uh, in, in Armenia itself. And there's been a lot of, they also have great wine now. And there's been a lot of investment from, particularly Armenians in California, trying to raise the economic and, and business climate uh, of the Republic of Armenia. And also help with the new government in rooting out corruption which is always a problem in, 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 in these new states, trying to get rid of the corruption. So that's another way uh, they can look. But it's, it's interesting to, to stand up, what do you do after you get what you want and realize that the world hasn't changed? But the third thing that the resolution calls for, which I think is very important, is educate. And so hopefully a lot of these uh, political activists will now turn their uh, efforts towards um, education. And particularly, I think, in the secondary schools. It's absolutely critical that we have teachers who are trained to handle uh, this issue and realize that it's not something, because I think if, I feel a lot of them, although they're well-meaning, feel like it's something added on to what they already have to teach, which is highly impacted. Um, you have only so much time to get through the 20th century and World War I, and you sort of just zip through it. And why do we need to take special time out for this? Um, but if they could really train them to to understand how to explain the Armenian genocide is integral to the modern world that comes into shape after World War I, um, I think that would be very useful. And then also within the academy at the, at the higher level, uh, in uh, higher education, we sort of have to grapple with how do we research genocide? Because it's obviously an incredibly personal issue I mean, it's not my family didn't go through it, but my wife's family did. You know, for her, it's a personal issue. But how do you study somebody else's personal trauma in a way that isn't, doesn't diminish their experience, but on the other hand is trying to look at 
sociological issues, historical issues, right? issues of justice, that in some ways is not necessarily just the experience of the survivor. Right? It has to look at the overall context in which these things happen and hopefully contributes to the dialogue that goes on to prevent ones from happening in the future. In other words, how do we make each of these genocides not just relevant to the people who are engaged, who have survived them, or who were impacted by them, but to all of us? Right? And I think that's the big challenge now. How do we broaden our perspective so that we see that this is unfortunately a legacy that we have to deal with in the 21st century? It did not go away in the 20th. It may have been born in the 20th, but it didn't die then. But until we come to grasp how much of a part of our world it is, we won't be able to stop it. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions. Okay.